All right, so we're on Chapter 37, which is essentially World War II. And then I'm going to just go through a quick slide uh, lecture for the second subheading, which is Total War, the World Under Fire. So um, up to this point, you know that Japan and Italy and Germany have been very aggressive. Now, the thing is, is that the Allies don't think that Germany is going to get too aggressive because they are caught. They could be in the middle of a two front war. So what's going to end up happening is Hitler is going to make some very important strategic decisions that's going to enable him to create a big empire. He's almost going to take over all of Europe. So what's going to happen is he makes that non-aggression pact with Stalin. So basically, they decide to split Poland. And so uh, Germany attacks Poland September 1st, 1939, and uses a... a a type of military tactic called Blitzkrieg or lightning war. Basically, you use um, a lot of uh, very aggressive air attack to soften resistance, and then you send tanks in on the ground to uh, take out an already softened up target. It's similar to the idea of shock and awe. We, we do it similar, but different. We have a different way that, that that's done now. So uh, very quickly, uh, Germany is able to cut through Poland. Uh, Soviets are able to do so as well, and they're basically able to, to split Poland. What's going to end up happening is that Germany as well is going to very quickly, in anticipation of uh, Britain finally doing something, um, they are going to send their U-boats into the Atlantic to try to, so to, to try to disrupt any sort of shipments that Britain is able to get. So with Poland and that kind of eastern front secure and not having to worry about the Soviets, Germany turns their attention to their western front. And so um, trying to remember and learn the battles from World War I, uh, France is really going to fortify what's called the Maginot Line right here, which is the easiest way for uh, France and Germany to attack each other. What Germany is going to do is do the Schlieffen Plan, which again, similar to what was in uh, the, the idea from World War I, so they're going to probably come across the top here and try to avoid uh, avoid this to try to attack and take out Paris. What they end up doing is they end up doing something slightly different. So again, they're coming from the north, which means that the, the allied forces are going to try to meet them up here and try to stop this. But the other thing that, they're, that Germany is going to do is they're going to send another group right here, right above that Maginot line. And what they're going to end up doing is they're going to end up basically cutting off the Allies' forces, and so with that, France is going to be able, is going to be forced to surrender, and Hitler, feeling a bit salty, is going to have France sign their surrender in the exact same railroad car that Germany had to sign their surrender for World War One, which leaves Britain kind of by itself, and they are going to get incredibly blitzed. That's what they're going to call it, the Blitz by the German. Uh, Luftwaffe. And so what's going to end up happening is tens of thousands of British citizens are going to get killed in these raids. There's going to be um, these sirens, which will air raid sirens going off, and people are going to have to try to, to, to hide, and it's going to be incredibly difficult. Uh, at this time, Winston Churchill makes his famous speech saying about how if Britain's around for another thousand years, let people say this was our finest hour. And so the British people rally with each other. Um, and the Royal Air Forces, eventually, they have to change their tactics. You don't really need to know that because it's not a military history class. Change their tactics to kind of help prevent these the splits, although they still lose, um, they still uh, lose again, thousands of billions, and, and a lot of cities are destroyed. What's going to end up happening is, is uh, eventually, Germany kind of slows that up. Uh, because it's time to go back to their eastern front again. So they la launched something called Operation Barbarossa, which is um, basically their quest to get more living space or living strong. So in Ju June 22nd, Hitler double-crosses Stalin, invades the USSR. Uh, Stalin's really caught off guard, and he smartly, though, takes a lot of the industrial uh, might of Russia and moves it, moves it to the east, into the Ural Mountains. So that's crucial. Once you don't have supplies then uh, you can't mount any sort of defense. And so what's going to end up happening is, um, is Germany, helped by uh, Romania and Hungary, are going to attack the Soviet Union, and they're going to be pretty successful. Um, they're going to take a lot of the areas that are basically on the footsteps of Moscow, Moscow at the gates of Stalingrad, and that is going to be essentially where... Um, where the Soviets are going to take their stand. Okay, so while that's important, it's really hard to use. Um, again, these lines are incredibly long, so it's really hard to do the, the Blitzkrieg type of offenses. Um, so they are going to get really far, but the issue is also going to be 
um, is going to be old general winter from the Soviets. So the, the winters can be incredibly difficult, and these supply lines are really hard to maintain in the midst of a, de a, of a devastating winter. So basically, um, at one point, it looks like that the Axis essentially wins. They've taken out, you've got the two Axis powers here, everything green is uh, basically occupied by the Axis powers, everything purple is um, is flat out allies with Germany. Uh, we've got the blue here are the kind of allied forces left, just basically Great Britain and um, what's left of the Soviet Union and everything else is just they're, they're forced into neutrality. So things are not looking good and don't worry, they get worse. So in the midst of this, the United States is involved in World War II before they're involved in World War II. Uh, the United States is going to initiate cash and carry policies and a lend-lease program, lend-lease program, which is going to make it basically easier for them to supply the allies. Um, the other thing is that the United States is going to know how dangerous Japan is in, um, in the Pacific, and so they're going to lead efforts to try to place embargoes on oil shipments to Japan. Now, Japan, realizing this, uh, their famous defense min minister, Tojo, is going to call uh, Pearl Harbor, the uh, the Navy base in Hawaii, a dagger aimed at the throat of Japan. And they are going to realize that, well, eventually the U.S. is going to get involved, so let's attack them first and try to just knock them out. Kind of a blitzkrieg, if they will. And so they do. And we have one of the worst days in U.S. history, December 7th, 1941. Uh, FDR called this a day which will live in infamy. Uh, this was, before 9-11, December 7th was the 9-11 for the United States. It was a horrible attack on the Pacific Fleet and Pearl Harbor, and they destroyed a huge amount of the U.S. Pacific Navy. Um, at this point, feeling gleeful and feeling like that they had won, Hitler and Mussolini will officially declare war on the United States on December 11th, as they're, uh, even though they didn't have to, uh, Japan was their ally, and so they do that, which takes away any sort of gumption that the U.S. has to not join the war themselves. And that is eventually, uh, and so um, so the U.S. is knocked down and they're having trouble. Japan is going to dominate Southeast Asia. Again, remember, as uh, Germany had taken out the, uh, the Dutch and the French, those colonies are up for grab. As they have Britain on the ropes, those colonies are up for grab. So Japan is going to create this greater, what they call a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. They're going to kind of sell it as, hey, we are helping uh, Asia to be able to stand alone and be an empire, uh, but it really is just an extension of like a huge Japanese empire. And again, that dagger here is uh, is Pearl Harbor. This is where Hawaii is. And kind of this red is the area that um, Japan is going to be able to secure. Uh, this Midway Islands will be important. I'll talk about that in just a second. So how did, they, how did these things, how did they get defeated? Well, the two things are going to be personnel re reserves and industrial capacity of the allies. Um, so especially once the U.S. can fully commits to the war, that huge industrial giant that the United States has realized it had become in the interwar period focuses on the war effort. And when they do, they're going to turn the tide. So especially things like shipbuilding, automotive production, it's going to be incredibly important to supply. So how is victory found in Europe? Well, what's going to happen is once Stalingrad, once that fight happens in Stalingrad, it's been exposed at how much the how how much the Nazis are exhausted, and so what will happen is is that the Soviets, just like kind of how they how Russia was able to push back rather quickly against Napoleon, once that's happened, they can start pushing quickly against um, against the Nazis, and so when they do that, um, that's good news, right? Because the Nazis are starting to get pushed back. Well, the big issue is if they're able to come back whatever the Soviets are able to win back is going to obviously be under their influence. So the United States and Britain realizes they need to get, they need to get uh, involved. And so what happens is, is that they first uh, take out Northern Africa and up into Italy. And then the next thing that they have to do is though Germany is very fortified in this part. And so they take a chance. They do D-Day, June 6, 1944. Very deadly attack on the beaches of Normandy. And um, the United States and Britain are able to create a beachhead there. And from there, they're able to really kind of fight back against Germany. Um, this is one of those days in history we look back and say, well, of course we won. And it's one of those things where it, it's not an of course we won. It's something that was really 50-50 at the time. 
So with the Soviet Union coming in from the east and Britain and the United States coming from the west, uh, they're going to meet in the middle and basically take out uh, Germ the Nazi Germany. Um, this is not going to be World War I, where they can just sign over a treaty. Uh, the U.S., Britain, and Soviets are going to destroy. It's going to make it very clear to all the Germans that the, that the Nazi party was wrong, and they're going to lose. So uh, Hitler commits suicide on April 30th, 1945, and Germany surrenders about a week later. Now, there's another important theater here. There's the Pacific Theater. And so uh, that's going to be led really by the United States. So the United States is fortunately going to um, discover, uh, have a program called Magic, which is going to help them to unravel the Japanese codes. Doesn't give them the entire game plan, but gives them a shot. And so they realize, and they find out about an attack, which is going to be really crucial here, which is going to be the Battle of Midway. So what's going to happen? is that um, the U.S. is going to learn of this attack and they are going to send off uh, especially some of their planes. And so basically they're going to, so Japan's going to attack us at the Battle of Midway. As they come, we have reinforcements, which are basically over the horizon, so the Japanese don't know about it. So the, the United States holds and then the reinforcements come in and the United States is able to win this incredibly important Navy battle. This is another one where you kind of look and say, well, yeah, of course the U.S. won. It wasn't a given. It was another 50-50. What ends up happening is the U.S. now has this huge issue. Is they've got a very, um, very passionate foe that are going to fight to the death. Um, and so there's going to be no surrendering. That's, that's going to be possible. So the Japanese, again, even going back into the Bushido codes, a lot of these soldiers are going to feel that it's not their life which is important, but the honor that goes with their life. And so they can't surrender. So the U.S. decides to do something that you can only do in the ocean, which is called an island hopping strategy. Every island that they have to take back from the Japanese is going to cost lives upon lives upon lives and be incredibly bloody. And so instead of trying to take every island, what they're going to do is they're going to hop to the important ones. And two of the most important ones is going to be Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And Iwo Jima is going to be is is those uh, is that very famous picture of the U.S. soldiers like bringing up the the uh, the flag. And it's going to be incredibly bloody for the United States to get that island. Um, the other thing that's going to make things really difficult is the Japanese are going to start to use ko uh, kamikaze, suicide bombers. So jets, which are basically just have a pilot, are stockpiled with bombs. And those pilots are literally going to crash into U.S. Uh, destroyers and shipping aircraft carriers. Uh, this is very personal for me. Um, my grandfather was on one of those ships that got hit by a kamikaze pilot. And thankfully, he was able to survive. So we have we have these battles that are incredibly difficult. We've got a two-month battle for Okinawa, which is just off of Japan, and that leads to a very difficult decision. So the U.S. again is is winning, but it's costing a lot of lives and it's incredibly bloody. So the U.S. is trying to um, is trying to take out Tokyo. The other thing, uh, so they were bombing and bombing and bombing. So, um, but kind of like what happened with the with Britain. Um, the people are going to rally around their empire, uh, rally around their emperor. And so the U.S. has a big issue on their hands because not only do they need to try to take out Japan, but also we have the Soviets who now, not having to worry about the Western Front, just like the United States, start putting their attention onto the Japanese empire. And just like in, in Europe, the United States is very passionate about not making sure, making sure the Soviets can't take over everything. And so what happens is, is that um, there's a decision that has to be made. And so a atomic bomb is invented in the United States. They don't let the Soviets know about it. They really don't know, let the world know about it. But they make a declaration that Japan needs to give up unconditionally or their military and possibly their homeland is going to be destroyed. Uh, Japan does not take the United States up on their offer. And so an atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Again, a, a similar uh, threat essentially was given to the, the Japanese by the United States that um, they had to give up unconditionally or the um, or their their military and or homeland was about to be destroyed. And Japan again holds and Nagasaki has an atomic bomb dropped on it. At that point, uh, the Emperor Hirohito, um, seeing uh, the uh, the Soviets starting to take over parts of Manchuria, seeing the United States with this incredibly horrendous weapon, decides to surrender unconditionally on September 2nd, 1945, 
very noteworthy. I've, I've read a couple of places that it was actually the first time that the emperor actually used, spoke on the radio to let people know that they had to surrender. And with that, that is the second heading of chapter 37.